Hey everyone, I'm Vince Salerno. I'm Eric Jenkins. And this is our Star Trek Beyond review. Now before we get started, we want to let you guys know we are talking all things about this movie, including spoilers, so if you have not seen Star Trek Beyond, please leave now, go see the movie, and then come back and let's talk about it. Otherwise, let's get into it. So, um... We saw this movie a uh, Friday. We were initially going to do our review on Friday, but we thought it'd be wise to uh, take some time to get our thoughts together and really think about the movie. And um, I was really looking forward to doing this review. I just wanted to not say get over, get, o- get it over with, but just you know talk about it. And I'm glad we waited because I I had time to think about a lot of things. And um, um, so I guess to start this review out, we will talk about the things we did like about uh, Star Trek Beyond. I'll start out. Um, I really like this movie. Um, what things I liked the most was really the character growth of all these characters, not just the main characters like um, Kirk and Spock and uh, Bones, but like everybody, like everybody has their moment to shine. And I don't necessarily mean everybody has their moment of growth, but everybody has their big moment, or everybody feels like it feels like they have. They all have a a good amount of screen time. Like, it's not just like the classic films. It's not just like Kirk, Spock, and then the other guys, and they're not even really essential. It's like everybody is essential, and it's the teamwork of everybody on the Enterprise that saves the day. Um, going into some of those uh, character arcs I talked about, um, we see this continuing arc of Kirk with his father. Um, he you know, feels he needs to live up to him, and um, he feels like, you know, he doesn't know if he really belongs on a starship anymore, and questioning, you know, what his future holds, what his uh, fate is um, outside the Enterprise, and he even fl- flirts with the idea of being an admiral, um, which, you know, it, most of you know in the the original films, he does become an admiral. So, I mean, maybe hinting at the possibility of him one day becoming an admiral. Um, probably not. <laughs> um, so, yes, a great, great growth of uh, of Kirk. I, I love I love this character. And the one thing that makes him so great is that Chris Pine, he doesn't really try to be uh, uh, William Shatner. He, he really tries to just be himself and make the character his own. Uh, which I, I admire greatly, um, and it works. I mean, because in a way, you know, there are you know character traits that are essential to Captain Kirk that Pine nails. But I mean, his personality, the way he says things, it's not like I need to do an impression of um, William Shatner. And it's funny because there are certain parts in this film where he does sort of do a, a small William Shatner impression, where he um, like they're on the USS Franklin and. Uh, Kirk's like, Mr. Sulu, you can fly this thing, right? I just, I just, I cracked up when I heard that. I was like, uh, you're doing a Shatner impression. Um, many other uh, lines in the movie felt that way. Um, one great relationship that we haven't really delved into in these new films is the relationship between uh, Spock and McCoy. Uh, now, I'm Spock's like one of my like my second favorite character in the Star Trek universe. And then Carl Urban, who plays. Uh, Bones is like one of my favorite actors. He just he just brings it with every role he has, and he's been bringing it with the character of uh, Bones. And man, is he funny in this movie! <laughs> he had a lot of like great comedic lines, and a, a lot of the uh, dialogue between Spock and uh, him is written really well. And I mean, it's it's interesting to see these two characters who are known for just, you know, not necessarily, like, hating each other, but not really liking each other. You see that throughout the classic series and these new films, but this is where we get to really delve into it. And you and you see, like, a real bond between these two men, and you and they start to... They start to get a deeper affection for each other. They start to have a real connection. Like, you know, initially, in the beginning, it's just like, great, of all the people I'm stuck with, it's got to be you, Spock. Um, but at the end, it's like, oh no! Uh, at least for Spock, it's like, no, I, 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 I respect this man. I trust this man, and um, like uh, the stuff with them in the uh, alien space or the cyborg spaceship. I don't know what, it, what kind of spaceships there are in this. Um, that stuff was great, um, and just you know, from Sulu to Chekhov uh, to Ahura to Scotty, um, who is the girl's name? The new, the new lady, Jayla. Jayla. 
um, all their dialogue, all their interactions, all their everything about those characters is written very well. Um, I think that was the main, all the main characters. <laughs> um, but yeah, very well done with the characters. Um, I like the the effects in this movie are, I mean, consistent with the franchise. Um, we're we've left the era of lens flares, which is a shame because I actually like the lens flares in Star Trek. Um, but some people didn't and their voices were more powerful than mine. So, <laughs> um, other things I liked, uh, just the overall, I guess the general story. Um, one thing that's, that the film suffers on and I think is the, uh, I guess sort of the plot of why the Enterprise and the crew of the Enterprise are stuck on this planet and their struggle. I, I'll get into that later, but what saves it is, is the cast. Like, I, I think, I've, I know I've been rambling on about the cast, but just the, the one thing that really saves this movie from suffering is the cast. Um, their interactions, their struggles, their arcs, all of that... Uh, keeps this movie afloat and makes it fun and immersive and makes it a a the thinking man science fiction story that Star Trek is. And that's one of the things I also liked is that it, it really does a great job at meshing old and new while still mostly being in the new and still be while you know still being a great action film but still being a thinking man film. And that's uh, I guess that's really the gist of what I really liked about this movie. Uh, Eric, you want to go into things you liked about Star Trek Beyond? Yeah, okay, so I guess I will start with the fact that this is Star Trek's 50th anniversary year, and I was really hoping that they would do something like what Doctor Who did and have like this big event and maybe, um, you know, a lot of references and maybe even some kind of time travel plot line, which would include uh, William Shatner or um, obviously Leonard Nimoy's not around anymore, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But they did, um, they did incorporate him in the film very well. That's one thing I forgot to add. Mm-hmm. But I w- was really surprised at how many references there were in this movie to other Star Trek shows. Not just the original series, but even Next Generation and Voyager. Definitely a lot of Enterprise ones and probably some Deep Space Nine ones I didn't recognize. Including, there's a line when um, Bones and Kirk are having a drink and Bones says, Here's to old age and a full head of hair, which I think is probably a a nod to Captain Picard, who is obviously um, usually older than Kirk and is bald. (laughs) And then there's a reference to um, the idea of people getting spliced in the transporter, which happens on a Voyager episode when Tuvok and Neelix get blended together into one person because of a transport malfunction. Um, Anyway, so there are just a lot of cool, um, cool nods like that. There's probably some more, um, definitely, definitely a lot of Enterprise, as in the series Enterprise references, but I'll get into those later. Mm -hmm. Um, some other cool things I liked about the movie is there's a lot of new technology that we haven't seen before, and new technology has always been a big part of Star Trek, obviously, and so I really liked that. And the first one that comes to mind is the swarm, the swarm ships. So we've seen before, obviously the Enterprise is pretty big. You know, but um, usually in Star Trek movies, especially but also in the TV shows, the bad guy has an even bigger spaceship. You know, I mean, think like V'ger, the Borg cubes, or even um, Nero's Narada, and then or uh, or uh, a Khan's ship in Into Darkness. Right, um, the Vengeance. Yeah, so. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's kind of the obvious thing to do. But it was cool how in this series, this movie, instead of having just one giant bigger ship, which we've seen before, it's a swarm of the, of, of tiny little ships. And an interesting thing about Star Trek is they've purposely tried to steer away from having fighters, as in an X-Wing fighter, or as in like a colonial Viper from Battlestar Galactica or something like that. Um, in the most part, it's, it's more about... I guess the the modern day analogy would be battleships as opposed to jet fighters, um, and it's not to say that they haven't dabbled in that before. On Nemesis, the Romulans have these things called Scorpion class fighters, but um, in general, they've they've made an effort to not delve into that territory. Because I mean, what are you gonna do? Have Kirk so, uh, suddenly leave the bridge and like, oh, I have to jump in my starfighter and go? No, his place is on the bridge. Um, 
But going back to the swarm ships, they're they're fighter esque because they're small, but they're not really fighters because they don't really have weapons of their own. Um, the ship itself is a weapon because they can crash into stuff and just tear through things. Um, anyway, so yeah, it was really cool and probably my the for me probably the coolest moment in the movie is when. Um, towards the end when there's the giant tidal wave of ships and the Franklin is going through it and it looks like it's surfing on them. Yeah. Super cool. That was, that was cool. I actually first saw that on a, a TV spot and I wish I hadn't seen that TV spot. Yeah, that's the thing I hate about TV spots. That's why I don't watch them is because they they think that they can just get away with revealing little tidbits like they did that for Ghostbusters. They almost, I mean, thank God they didn't do that for Star Wars, but they, they came close to it. Yeah. And, um... Yeah, sometimes it just ruins it for people. They don't realize it. So it's best to just hold back as much footage as possible. Um, that's one thing I, I really just want to touch on that. Um, that that final, that that near the end where they're fighting the swarm ships and they're going through it and they need to create that high frequency and they use the, the sabotage song mm-hmm. to create that high frequency and they're, f- they're surfing on them and they're blowing up while they're surfing on them. It's kind of cool. Um, it works. Like yeah, we, we talked about it how surprisingly like, does. We talked about how that song in the first trailer kind of ruins oh, yeah. the the vibe of Star Trek, and it's a nasty like, taste. In my well, mouth. it's a nasty taste. But looking, but seeing that how it fits into the movie, and especially Kirk saying like it's a good choice. It's like yeah, that's that's consistent with the character. But also, at least for me, that trailer doesn't seem as bad anymore. I'm like okay. That's that's actually really cool. I, I dig it. I, I don't mind the that first trailer now. Now that I understand the context of the song in the movie. Yeah, it, it kind of reminded me of um, the Voyage Home. It seemed like it, there are a few similarities to it. The it made me think of that because on Voyage Home, there's the scene on the bus where there's the guy playing the loud rock music, and then yeah. also just the idea of they have to uh, use this old ship that's not actually theirs. Right, um, and they they find like this surprising way of of fighting the bad guys. Like, oh, let's use this. You know, it's kind of like who would have thought? Let's who use wh- thought, let's yeah. use whales to to talk to this giant alien probe. You know, it's like let's use this obnoxious rock song. Yeah, exactly. Blow. That's a good point. It's it's consistent with like you know, like this this subtle uh, subtle absurdity. Yeah. In Star Trek, which yeah, works. it was cool. It was cool, and uh, that's and they had to think about it, and they're like, wait, what if we did this? It wasn't just a stupid. It wasn't just like Captain Kirk says, "Hey, put on some rock music while we blow these up." They're actually using the music yeah. to the music is the weapon. And it's like they acknowledge the fact that yeah, this is an obnoxious song. But that's why it disrupts the Exactly. the yeah. cybernetic field that the ships communicate with. It's it works really well. Um so any anything else you want to add real quick? Um just some other cool new technology was uh, the, the gas that Jayla uses that solidifies. And then um, the Starbase was really cool, Starbase Yorktown. Uh, a little obscure fact is that when Roddenberry first pitched Star Trek to CBS, who um, turned him down, he the ship was originally called the Yorktown, not the Enterprise. So that was a cool little reference that I caught there. Um, probably not a lot of people would have caught that. Um, anyway, another thing is that I really was fascinated by the villain in this movie. Um, he's not, and objectively, he's not the best villain, you know. Um, he could have been, they could have gone into his, they could have explored him a little more, made him a little more in-depth. He's kind of two-dimensional, but, um, it was interesting how he, he almost reminded me of, almost a Doctor Who villain. Um, the way he's trying to suck people's life force and how he's deformed and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and thinking about it more, he's actually pretty consistent with a lot of tropes that we've seen in in Star Trek previously, where... So, spoiler, he is a former Starfleet captain who has been alive since, like, the 2160s or something like that. So he's been around for over 100 years, or at least 100 years by this time. And uh, he crashed on this planet. He uses this alien technology, which is some kind of bioweapon, reminiscent of the bioweapon used on Star Trek Nemesis, um, to suck people's life force and live longer, but it deforms him into this, so he looks like an alien. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the technology, like, blends his human DNA with the DNA of the aliens who who made the technology? I don't know, but Mm -hmm. anyway. Um, But throughout Star Trek, we've seen a lot of uh, 
Starfleet captains who come to this planet and find a planet and find some means of immortality, but of course always has disastrous consequences. So think like Roger Corby on the TOS episode, Where Little Girls Made Of, or even Mark Jameson on um, the Next Generation episode, Too Short a Season, or um, Captain Tracy on the TOS episode, The Omega Glory. It's a pretty um, standard part of Star Trek, but they're able to do it in a new way, which was, um, it, was it could have been more, it could have been more interesting. Um, the whole bad guy, his, his philosophy was kind of weak. I think the themes overall about unity in the movie were, were pretty hackneyed. Uh, honestly, I didn't. They didn't really resonate with me. They just seemed kind of, just really that. That's what you want. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's interesting how he is supposedly against unity because he thinks that, um, you know, the kind of Kantian philosophy that the Starfleet is built upon reduces. Uh, the strength of humanity is kind of a Nietzschean idea, which I, th- I thought was interesting. They mixed that in. But it's ironic because um, his swarm ships are a massive unity in of themselves, you know? Yeah. And it's by breaking apart their unity that they all crash into each other and the swarm ships are defeated. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, kind of a, kind of a contradiction there. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, um, I'm gonna, like, just going to disagree. I, I like the themes of Unity in this film, especially with the Enterprise crew, because they, it really is about them coming together to fix the problem. Uh, and, you know, that that's where they, in the way they beat the bad guy philosophically, it's like, no, Unity always wins, like, because you, you can't fight these things alone. And when you're surrounded by people you love who want to help you and support you, when you're surrounded by your friends... You know, you're unstoppable. Yeah, I think that's where that's what Kirk realizes, and that's what causes him to stay on the Enterprise, and that's what causes Spock to stay on the Enterprise because both of them decide to leave. Um, Kirk wants to leave because he doesn't know if he wants to be spend his entire life on the Enterprise. They make that very clear in the beginning of the movie, and Spock doesn't know if he wants to stay on. He, Spock wants to leave Starfleet because he believes that what's important is that he uh, helps establish his the Vulcan race because they're an extinct species. So he needs to preserve the Vulcan race uh, just in case something happens to them, Uh, mainly because um, he finds out that Ambassador Spock, who is the original Spock, Leonard uh, Leonard Nimoy, uh, he has died in the Star Trek, uh, in in this film. He has passed away, Um, which is kind of interesting because his uh, his, uh, tombstone, if you will, not really tombstone, but uh, his... Marker says uh, 20, I believe it's 2333, 2333 through 2363, hmm. which is interesting because, you know, he obviously goes back in time and he stays in the past to help yeah. establish the Vulcan, the new Vulcan, as they call it, um, which is really cool. Um, so moving on now, we're going to talk about some things we didn't like. Um, so I'm going to start off. Uh, so Eric, while you dig the villain a little bit, I really don't. Uh, first, I'm going to say Idris Elba is a great actor and does what he can with this role. I mean, he's he is phenomenal. But the character in itself is kind of lame. Yeah. Um, one, it's I mean, it's established later on that he's not an alien, and that really threw me off because it's like, okay, well then, what is all this blue gunk and scales on his face? Mm-hmm. And they never really they never really go into that. I don't know if that's some sort of disease or if, if he's like meshed with like an alien or something, or he's just been on this planet for so long and the the atmosphere has made his face all dingy. But oh, that's interesting. But idea. then again, like other characters, like his minions, have this same look to them as well, even though like their faces are different colors. His is blue. There's a gray guy. There's an orange lady. But uh, it doesn't. It it's not explained, and it. And it, it bugged me the entire time. It's like, and it would have almost been better if Crawl was just an alien the entire time. I don't need him to be a Starfleet captain or anything like that. I just need him to be a bad guy. And I want him to have legit reason to bring these people together. Um, because I, I think destroying the Enterprise just to get this stupid artifact, then go back to Yorktown to destroy it because he's mad at, at the Federation is kind of dumb because as Eric said it's it's a consist it's a trope that's been used in Star Trek before and in in this case they use it in a very bad way. I think I think we we were talking about this last night that there, there are multiple scenarios you could go into to make this character great while mm-hmm. still keeping the the 
some of the uh, excuse me fundamental aspects of crawl. Uh, I'm not going to go into them right now, but I really think you, th- this was a missed opportunity to create a very interesting villain. And he, like you said, he was very two dimensional, very traditional. Um, and his, his the B story with him is where the film suffers. And like I said, it's it's because of the cast and their chemistry that really saves the film. Because to me, the movie is about the un- the unit the uniting of the team of the Enterprise. And once they are broken apart, they unite to stop this villain and save the Federation. Which to me, that's the core of the movie is the Federation is Enterprise. Team Enterprise coming together and saving the day. Um, so the villain doesn't work for me very much. Um, this is a minor, minor uh, quip, but uh, I don't like that Kirk and Chekhov and some of the other characters spend half the movie in their non-traditional uniforms. Like, mm. like I, you know, I want to see Kirk in his yellow, his yellow suit. I want to see Spock in his yellow suit. I want to see Chekhov. Suit. Sorry, blue suit. Yeah, like I like those costumes and. You know, they're not. They, seldom do they change into other costumes, but um, in the original series. So I, I wish we had more of that. I mean, we did get a, a fair amount of that in uh, Into Darkness. I think that was probably mm-hmm. the most time we saw Kirk and his, his and Spock in their normal suits, and actually Spock more so than anybody. I think. Um, so I wish we still would have seen more of that. That's just a minor quip. Um, other, th- I mean, I really don't have much else to say in terms of what I didn't like, because because it's it is a great movie. Um, I also, I guess, I just don't like that this movie feels, it feels separate from the first two films, and not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but it it feels like an odd numbered Star Trek. It movie. feels like an odd numbered Star Trek movie, but it's. <laughs> Which it is. It, which it is, yeah. Not to say that it's bad. And that's, I guess I also, really quick, I want to make a connection. Um, in Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock, the Enterprise blows up. Yeah. In Star Trek Beyond, the third movie, the Enterprise blows up. Mm. Which is another thing I have to complain. Why the hell we keep blowing up the Enterprise? Yeah, come on. Leave it alone, guys. Come on. I mean, it's, 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 it's annoying. It's can, nauseating. The yeah, first film... It is. The first film... We didn't have anything happen to it. That was major. Second film, it's literally like hanging by a thread by the end of the movie. It's like, come on. And then this movie just like the uh, the thrusters on the back are torn off. The disc is separated from the the connector yeah, piece, whatever it's called. Star and then that Trek. disc is just... Pfft, it's like, come on. Seriously. I think that was a could have been a reference to Generations, Star Trek Generations. So the, the saucer section of... The Galaxy Class Enterprise right. has a similar yeah. thing. Yeah, uh, Kirk's insurance fees must be exorbitant because he's yeah. totaled like three Starship Enterprises at this point. Um, but in, yeah. but I mean, he by in a way he does. I mean, the the difference is he actually like saves the wor- saves the Federation That's and true. saves the world when he does it. So it's like okay, well, I guess talk, talk about um, what you were telling me the other day about how Nero, Khan, and Crawl. Their, their issue with the Federation. Yeah, exactly. So basically, they're all s- mad because the feder- the Federation hurt my feelings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys won't let me uh, help my family. You guys let me destroy my planet. You guys you guys abandoned me. You hurt my feelings. Yeah, <laughs> it's tor- yeah that's, you nailed it. It's what it boils down to. And it's annoying. I don't need these p- villains to be connected to the Federation. It would have been, I would have been. I would have been floored. I crawl would have been a great villain if he was just an alien, who like this is okay. I'm gonna go into one of my theories about restructuring beyond. It would have been really cool if crawl was this guy who um, he can be an alien. He can be. He, he can still be a a a, a, a um, Federation uh, captain, whatever. Um, but they him and his ship crash on this planet. And he finds out the secret to eternal life. But the cost of that is that he has to suck the life out of all of, of out of people to keep that life force going. So he sucks the life out of all of his crewmates. And then he has no one else to suck the life, life out of. So using his swarm of uh, ship drones or whatever, he goes out hunting for... These ships go hunting for other... Like, you know, the Enterprise. And they... They bring the the people to the planet, and basically, Crawl would be this collector of people who use who 
keeps these people in storage, and then once he needs to, he'll use them. He'll suck the life out of them and keep his eternal life going. And then maybe he finds out about Yorktown, and the reason why he goes to destroy Yorktown is because he he wants to get more people. So that's when the Enterprise has to go back and you know save the destruction of Yorktown and stop Crawl from killing everybody. Mm-hmm. Like I think that would have been a great plot. Um, that's just me. That's just me riffing off Star Trek. Want I, what I wanted for Star Trek Beyond. Um, Eric, do you have any, really quick? Do you have anything, anything to say that you didn't like about the film? Um, Cause we're running short. Yeah, on going time. going back to the theme. I guess the whole unity thing would have been more. It would have been stronger if in the beginning of the movie the Enterprise crew is fractured somehow. So, but, uh, you know what I mean? Because the beginning of the movie, they're all they're all getting along pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's just one thing. But for the most part, there are a lot of things that I really liked that they. I'm glad that they did not do. Um, for instance, there's not there's not any just stupid manslut moments with Kirk like there were in the previous two movies. <laughs> um, one thing that I did not think added to the well, movie. Well, there was one. In Beyond. In Beyond, he takes his shirt off. <laughs> Oh, well... But it's not, like, a sex scene. No, no, of course not. He's just putting on a new shirt. Right, right, so, yeah. So, I mean, but it's, it, it does cater towards the... And the, there's that the little... There, that Charlie Brown moment when he's like, what shirt should I wear today? And they're like, all... <laughs> they're all <laughs> yellow. <laughs> and black. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, Anyways, so yeah. one thing that, that I didn't really care much for is I did not think the homosexual overtones with Sulu added anything to the movie. Yeah, I agree. Um, but I don't know. I, I can see, like... I, <sighs> Des, despite what we think about the homosexual discussion it was it was a nice thing to to reference or pay tribute to uh george takai especially during the 50th anniversary but it adds nothing and it's and george takai himself was he didn't like it he didn't like it it's like i said before um George Takai and and uh, Sulu are the same person but they're not the same person at the same time there are certain things that you cannot um, contribute to Sulu, and there are certain things you cannot contribute to George Takai, the real person. Mm-hmm. And of course, George Takai takes precedent over that because he's actually a real person. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. But hey, but but Sulu is still awesome in this movie. Sulu is, he is still so a he's badass. so cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I mentioned him with the other cast, but yeah, Sulu. Sulu is great. Sulu is really good. Oh yeah. Yeah, especially the part when um, they have to drop the Franklin off the cliff to reach the yeah. lost. Oh, oh my gosh, so cool! He that's really his time to shine in the yeah. movie. Of course, he he has a lot of cool moments. Like on he the, does the first one, he whips out that samurai sword, and then in the second one, when I want um, to see more of that. When he takes when he is left in command, you know, yeah, of the Enterprise, like Mister Sulu. Remind me never to piss you off. You yeah, know? Sulu always has cool moments. Sulu he's, is he's really, great. really a great character, and unfortunately, doesn't get enough credit. I I hope they. I hope this these films continue to focus more on the entire crew and not just Kirk and Spock and Bones and Ahura. Like I really want, I really want you know. I mean, these characters do uh, you know have their moments. But I wanted to consistently be that because you know, like we said, the original films never really focused on the unity of the entire team. It was just sort of like the show, but more emphasis was put on the personal relationship between Spock and Kirk. So I want to yeah. see more of that in these in these future films. Okay, let's uh, give our scores then real quick. I'm going to give Star Trek Beyond a... I'm going to give it a 7.8 out of 10. Um, I don't think this is the best Star Trek movie. I don't even think it's the best out of the three. Um, I'm actually going to... I need to see it a second time. It's number three of the rebooted Star Trek films. So for me, it goes Into Darkness, Star Trek, and then Beyond. Um, not to say Beyond is a terrible film. It's a great film. Um, it's, a gr- it's, a, it's a great combination of old and new, and it's, ce- it's a celebration of Star Trek. As Eric said, there's a lot of great references for fans, and it really puts emphasis on they're in their five-year journey, and that's what makes it so fun is that we're not you know, going back to... Starfleet to yeah, check in so on glad things. We go back to Earth. Not that I, I actually enjoyed that stuff, um, but it's fun to see them in their five year journey, and that's what's exciting about it. And I hope that you know we still get a me- we still you know go back to Federation every now and then. But I'm looking forward to future films. I'm looking forward to Star Trek Four. We talked a lot about the possibility of uh, not only uh, Kirk's dad showing up, but also Pike, because Pike is technically the uh, 
uh, a father figure in Kirk's life, so it would make sense that he comes back in some capacity, or even... Or William Shatner. Or William Shatner. We talked about William Shatner coming back. It would just be so great to get William Shatner to come back for one scene or something. Anyways, I'm getting off topic, but yeah, Star Trek Beyond is a great movie. Not the best Star Trek film, but definitely one that is crafted with love. Justin Lin, the director of Fast and Furious, does a great job and establishes himself as more than just a guy that blows stuff up. He does a phenomenal job at handling the themes, the characters, the arts, and the special effects. It's a fun movie, and fans of the old and the new series will love it. Mm -hmm. So, Eric, your your score real quick. Yeah, somewhere between a 7 and 8 uh, out of 10. It was... It was really good, and I gotta give a shout out to Simon Pegg for writing the script for this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's funny because there's the I referenced it a minute ago. There's um, this idea out there that the odd numbered Star Trek movies are not as good as the even numbered ones, and Simon Pegg himself even said this a few years ago on a TV show he was on. Little did he know that he would find himself having to write, write an odd number. write an odd number Star Trek, and so um, yeah, it was it was. Uh, as a screenwriter myself, also working on a movie of the same genre, uh, I have a lot of respect for what he did. Um, I think the movie is really well structured. Um, you know, the the just um, which is so hard to do. You know, to nail all of the different beats in the movie um, and do them well. He did a great job. Uh, also, the character of Jayla was really great. Yeah, She's, Jayla was great. Yeah. She wasn't, to mention her. Because how many times on Star Trek is there some annoying alien girl? A lot. Yeah. Not the case this time around, so that was cool. Um, yeah, so... She was, yeah, she was very well done. I forgot to mention her. Uh, great performance from Sophia Batella. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. Well, thank you for listening to our review of Star Trek Beyond. We want to give a shout-out to our buddy, J.J. Schindler. Unfortunately, he, I told you guys he would be here to do the review. Unfortunately, he could not be here today. We want to give a shout-out to him. He did enjoy the movie... And echoes a lot of our thoughts, I think. Mm. All right. Uh, be sure to give us a like, comment. Let us know your thoughts on the movie. Did you like it? Did you hate it? Let's have a conversation. Uh, I, you guys can find me on Twitter at TheBigBee75 and on Instagram at TheBigBee75 underscore Vince. Um, all my other social media links are going to be in the description below. All right, guys. God bless and live long and prosper.